Hi, Jim Phelps here with a preface to this volume. These are my last five quick takes. A team of specialists will be taking over. For this last set, unlike the past, I have selected the articles. So whereas healthy skepticism is always a good thing, perhaps a bit more of it is warranted for these articles as I'm using them to present my personal point of view before I leave. Thanks for listening. And now for the 52.1. In 2022, the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists published the most recent clinical guidelines for the treatment of mood disorders. The introduction to these guidelines describes a mood spectrum, pressions ranging from purely unipolar to fully bipolar, with people all the way along in between. In other words, in these guidelines, the authors have switched from the categorical diagnostic system of the DSM to a dimensional approach. If you have any doubt about this, see there figure three entitled The Mood Spectrum. This shift from categorical to dimensional represents the evolution of a concept I first encountered back in the 1990s, a concept made formal in 2002 in an invited review for the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry. Highly respected authors Nasir Ghami and Fred Goodwin presented the research literature supporting a spectrum approach to mood disorders. I contrast these two papers from 2002 and 2022 to highlight two things. First, change can be slow. This reconception of mood disorders from categorical yes-no, bipolar or unipolar, to a dimensional view has taken nearly my entire practicing lifetime. Secondly, while the new guidelines ought to end any further debate about how to diagnose bipolar disorders, they won't, because many psychiatric specialists rightly worry that including more patients under a bipolar umbrella could do harm. So let's look closely at that. At the bipolar end of the mood spectrum, nearly everyone agrees don't use antidepressants as monotherapy. At the unipolar end, for want of a better term, although this includes numerous kinds of depression, Antidepressants are routine. And what about the middle? How bipolar should a patient be for you to switch strategies from antidepressants to a mood stabilizer with antidepressant effects, such as lamotrigine or low-dose lithium? How much bipolarity warrants this change in treatment approach? Well, that hasn't been studied because, until now, there was no middle of the mood spectrum officially, only the two ends. So without research guidance, after you've discussed non-pharmacologic options, your clinical decision boils down to, in my view, antidepressants versus lamotrigine, or maybe low-dose lithium, especially if suicidality is a concern. This decision will be based on your estimate of the treatment's benefits and risks, but also, crucially, on your estimate of the consequences of being wrong. Suppose you prescribe lamotrigine, in what's actually a unipolar depression. There's the 1 in 2,000 rash risk and likely no efficacy beyond placebo, although a placebo is a very substantial drug, right? Antidepressants are not a whole lot better on average. Compare prescribing an SRI in a patient with significant bipolarity. The probability of benefit is significant here, but there are the risks of SRIs that anyone faces, weight gain, sexual dysfunction, and a potential for severe withdrawal when discontinuing, plus, in this case, the risk of inducing rapid cycling, mixed states, and treatment resistance. I think these latter risks are substantial based on 20 years during which I had the luxury of 25 or sometimes 50-minute appointments, so I got to hear lots of detail about patients' experience on antidepressants. As a result, my risk-benefit analysis leads me to consider lamotrigine much farther down the mood spectrum than many of my colleagues. Notice we're not talking about quetiapine or some of the other second-generation antipsychotics as a mood stabilizer. That would be concerning in terms of the risk-benefit ratio because I fear we're grossly underestimating the impact of inducing metabolic syndrome. So, if the choice between an antidepressant and lamotrigine depends on how bipolar is this patient, how are you supposed to determine that? Gami and Goodwin's paper from 20 years ago detailed the answer. In the middle of the mood spectrum, 
Mania is by definition absent, and hypomania will be subtle or even less evident. So instead, you assess non-manic markers that are statistically associated with bipolar disorder, but not in the DSM. Family history, age of onset, of the first depression, that is, course of illness, how it's cyclic, how recurrent is it, and response to treatment, particularly highly energized adverse reactions to antidepressants. These form the bipolarity index, a thrice validated measure in which non manic markers are given 80% of the diagnostic weight, while the DSM manic symptoms get only 20%. That's how important these other four domains are family history, age of onset, force of illness, and response to treatment. I think they're so important. I'm going to say that again. Family history of bipolar disorder, which granted is always a little tricky. Age of onset, namely early 18 to 24. Force of illness, namely highly recurrent, episodic, and response to treatment. Adverse reactions to antidepressants in particular. To help you gather these essential diagnostic data, a one and a half page questionnaire gets you all of them as well as DSM symptoms. It's called Mood Check. You can download it from the references because you simply can't answer the key question, how bipolar is this patient, without those. Gami and Goodwin made that case 20 years ago, and the new guidelines make it, well, almost official now.